what I've been seeing here uh, over the last few days and what I've been hearing for a while um, from DJ Kumar, uh, from everybody who's working here, is a fantastic example of what can be done when we put um, the intelligence of natural systems together with the intelligence of the human family. So I wanted to start uh, with this photograph of a, of a piece of land. This is actually in southern Africa that has been restored. And have you imagine taking your shoes off and standing on the right side? And how quickly do you want to jump over to the other side? <laughs> so we know a lot of science we understand with our own bodies. We don't have to explain very much to know that the right side is going to be much hotter than the left side. And not just for us, but for the animals that live there. And it's not just under our feet, but in the air around our bodies. And it's also going to be hotter for all of the soil life that is trying to build a functional soil sponge, functional topsoil. Uh, you can also imagine that if you poured a glass of water on the right side, it would evaporate much more quickly. It would be gone into the air. So we understand the science with our bodies. There are many, many other questions we can ask with this photo, but let's look at some more pictures. So first, I just wanted to introduce you to my own watershed. I come from Vermont in the Northeast United States, and this is the Umpampanusik River. It's an indigenous name of the river. Uh, and it's so clean that we can swim in there. We're very lucky. Next one. Uh, this is in the autumn there where the, the vegetation turns red. And winter, which we have a lot of snow in the winter. My sons are playing there. And we have a game we like to throw snowballs and see if we can break the ice in the river. So. <laughs> but in spring, it can get, as the snow melts, it gets very wild there. And one year, uh, it got so wild that it, it really broke out and we had some very big flooding. And this flooding was the thing that got me most interested in the connection between the whole landscape and water. And actually just two years ago we had another major flood. This was not a, not a hurricane, it didn't have a name or anything. But this is the road behind my house. I live in a small village of about 3,000 people. And uh, I went away for the weekend. And when I came back, this is what it looked like, the same road. And we live in a small town, and not very many people to pay for repairs. So it's taken two years and over a million dollars spread out among 3,000 people to repair that road. And just it's just now been repaired this summer beautiful, lush, green agricultural land, and we have a huge lake there. But if you go close to the lake, it looks like this. This is an al algae bloom. And what we know is this is very, very toxic. If a dog drinks out of that lake, it will die. Uh, if humans go swimming there or drink it, uh, we get a lot of liver problems, a lot of other issues. And we also are finding out that it's creating long-term neurological problems. So things like uh, ALS, which is a long-term neurological issue, or Parkinson's, or Alzheimer's, may be connected to this uh, water that has this bloom in it. So uh, as I started to understand all of these things, I thought the best way to learn is to turn around and teach. And I know that this is part of the FFS model and part of the ZBNF model. And when I learned about these, both of these models, I felt right at home. And uh, so I created a manual a few years back that is, that is geared for people who want to, to learn and teach. But it was also a way for me to learn, was to write this manual. Um, I used to be a healthcare provider, natural medicine. And, uh, and for me, this connection between soil and water is very intricately connected to human health and to the health of the whole ecosystem. So the essential piece that I want you to understand today, only one thing to take away, is that healthy soil is like a sponge. 
It's, it's a living matrix, like very complex, and it soaks up water. So these are just words, but let's try it with a picture. So, so this I developed because I needed to teach people for uh, you know, five-year-olds and people on Wall Street, businessmen, and people at the UN, people from very different backgrounds, and I needed one way to show this very quickly and easily. So um, I talk about the difference between healthy soil and unhealthy soil as a difference between flour and bread. That if you rain on that flour, the pieces are all separate, right? And if you put water on it, it's going, it's going to, the water is going to go sideways, not downhill. And it's going to take some of that soil with it, and it's going to bring it into the river. So let's talk a little bit about when we say the flour uh, is small individual particles. And that's, you know, if we're talking about a soil or a uh, landscape, those are the broken down rocks, just little pieces of sand, silt, and clay. But there is no biology, nothing living to hold those together. But if you take that sand, silt, and clay, those broken down rocks, and you add biology, the biology has glues and threads and things that move through there that suddenly make something that has structural integrity that will not fall apart if you blow on it or if you put water on it. it, it okay, we have some flooding happening here. We have erosion. If we had a house on top of there, the house might be sliding down the hill. Okay, and okay, that's good. And and is that water going down to the plant roots? No, they're not getting any of that water. It's going sideways. It's not going down. Yes. To turn flour into bread, we add yeast, right? Some kind of yeast. Sometimes it's from the air. Sometimes it's from a package. But we add biology, and suddenly we have something quite different. All of those little pieces are now stuck together in a matrix. The wind comes, nothing bad happens, right? It doesn't go into the air. And if water comes, if rain comes, what happens? So instead of going sideways and falling apart, it's now going in. It's going down, you know the water table that uh, we talked about in the very first talk? That water table is coming up. The bore wells are filling up. The ponds are filling up. Keep going. Oh, yeah, we can. And you know, you can even take the cup aside and pour it directly. What if we have the, the monsoon comes? <laughs> even then, it's going to fill up, OK? <laughs> OK. Now, after a little while, the water is going down in, and it's coming out the bottom. That's filling up the wells. And when it comes out the bottom, it's clean. It's been filtered through there. It's been filtered by that physical filter. But it's also filtered by biology. The biology is breaking down any, any chemicals, anything that's problematic. So that's not going into the water. OK, if you build your house there, see? <laughs> OK, and the plant roots underneath here, it's wet all the way down. That's a reservoir that's protected. So nobody can steal that water from you. <laughs> and it's protected if the sun comes out, it's not going to evaporate. It's very slowly evaporating only through the plants. But it's not coming right off the surface. And it doesn't form a crust. So the next time the rain comes, it's still very open. And who has made that sponge? Can a human being make that? A human being cannot make that. Only a living system can make that. And it takes everybody. Humans, too. Because humans' responsibility is not to destroy it. Okay, the first thing that happens is the plant roots are feeding some sugars down into the microbes, and then those microbes are making glues and slimes. You know, we all have uh, glues and slimes that come out of our bodies, even the microbes. <laughs> and they stick those pieces together, and the little root hairs and the fungal hyphae tie, tie them together like thread, just like you make clothes. And then, uh, and then all of the life starts to move through there. So the worms, the beetles, 
the, I don't know which animals you have that move through the soil there, but everything is making passageways through there. But as they make those passageways, it doesn't fall apart. It stays intact. Close up picture of the soil sponge. You can see those little pieces, but you can also see that something is holding them together and there is space. space. And this structural integrity, we can see it that on on the left side, we have unhealthy soil, and on the right, we have healthy soil. And even if you leave this for the whole day, on the right side, it's, those glues are very strong and they'll stay intact. We can measure that. One simple way of measuring it is to put something in the ground, pour water in, and keep track of how long does it take the water to go down. So if it's unhealthy soil, it might be an hour for an inch of water to go down. Healthy soil, it might be just a few seconds for it to go down. This is an example uh, with five soils from, they're all the same soil type. So they have the same ratio of sand, silt, and clay, but they have been farmed in different ways. So on the far left, it's very much like ZDNF. On the far left, we have, we have green growth all year round. We have no disturbance and we have diversity. And in this case, we also have animals in the system. And we have and we have not plowed it or tilled it. Okay, and on the far right, we have more conventional, a lot of a lot of inputs, uh, a lot of tillage, monocrop, and uh, and only a crop during the, the the most productive growing season and bare the rest of the time. And underneath you can see that there are uh, some bottles. I don't know if we can turn off the light for a moment to see this a little more clearly. So, so on the bottom there's a bottle that's collecting what's going in, but in the front is collecting the rain that's coming off. Yeah, great. So, so in the healthy one, you can see that all of the rain went in, went down into the water table, into the wells, filling it up, and it's clean and nothing has come to the front. And on the far right, you can see that no water went in. None of the rain soaked in, it all came off the front, and it took a lot of soil with it. And in between, you can see the transition, the transition from conventional uh, kind of uh, green revolution type farming over to something more like the PNF, and you can see it gets better and better and better with each thing that you add to the system. So there, soil is very much like a human body, and there are things that we can do to keep it healthy. So one thing is that we keep those living roots in the ground as long as possible. So they're feeding the life through the sugars that they make. Uh, they're feeding it underground. We also need to keep the surface protected with plants and mulch. So we have living plants, and we also have plants that are in the process of dying and decomposing. And those feed two different types of communities, of underground communities. And also the mulch protects from the rain. Uh, we need to disturb the soils as little as possible, so preferably to eliminate all of the plowing and tillage. Very important, a diversity of plants and that diversity of plants brings with it a diversity of insects, of animals, of, uh, of other things that are eating the plants. And most of the insects are actually beneficial insects. There are almost 2,000 beneficials for one pest. So you, you need to be very thoughtful. If you apply an insecticide, you're killing everybody. So who has food first? The, the veg. The veg insects, <laughs> which it taught me this uh, the way of thinking about it. <laughs> the ones that eat the plants have food, so they're going to come first. Then later the other ones will come to eat them. But if you keep applying insecticide, you're only going to be feeding more and more plants to those insects. Um, and then this one, uh, I think, is in, in ZBNF, you're seeing this with the application of the, the formulas that you're using with dung and urine. But in some other systems, we're actually bringing animals into the system. And so those are both different ways of integrating animals. So uh, again, in this one, 
we have there are animals on both sides of this system. These are grazing systems, and this is a fence down the middle. And on the right side, the animals are allowed to go wherever they want to go. And just like you, if you were in the supermarket and you had you're in the market and you had lots of time, you would only pick your favorite foods. But if you if you were moved through quickly, you would eat everything and you would run, right? <laughs> So on the left side, we're moving the animals much more quickly and more close together, much more the way they would be in the wild. And, and that way, everything gets evenly eaten, and you have a long period of rest, and suddenly you see a lot of change there. On the right side, they eat only the favorite ones, and then the ones that are more bitter, that don't taste so good, that are prickly, those ones grow and they shade out the other, and soon you have a desert. So Walter will talk maybe a little bit more about this, but this, this capacity of life, of plants, to break down rocks and turn them back into a living soil started with these lichen, which are growing on everything. Next one. And then the photosynthesis happens in all different layers. Next one. And, and it's feeding so many different things above and below the soil. So we have this whole soil food web. It's a whole ecology. Next one. And of course, it's feeding things that live above the ground. And it's creating food for humans. And in Vermont, we have these amazing animals. I don't know if you have in India, beavers? No? <laughs> so they take, the, they take the trees, and they cut them down, and they build dams to slow the water. So here, you might have to do it yourself. But we're talking very small dams. And that slows the water and sinks it and builds up beautiful soils. And so, but this is happening with beavers. It's happening with humans, often on much too large of a scale. But it also happens underground. So underground, these uh, the soil sponge helps to sink the water and keep it in the in the ground rather than going too quickly across. And this is the circle of life, all the way around. Okay, then we start to get the whole thing working. And even though I know that you have a lot of bare rocks out there, which we have also in Vermont because we overgraze too much, uh, life offers us a lot of hope. So we can see trees growing, growing on bare rocks. And there's this quote that life is the most powerful geological force. So you see how a tree and a plant of any size can break open a rock, and the biology underground can do that too. That, that's why you don't need to add fertilizer, because all of those minerals are in the rocks, but if you have biology that can access that and break it, and break it down, and bring it back to the plant, then you don't need to access it. You don't, you don't need to add it. Okay, next one. So uh, just to wrap it up, why should we care about this soil sponge? So this is a plant health pyramid uh, by one of our farmers in the United States, who's showing that, um, that photosynthesis creates certain benefits, just having very effective photosynthesis. But to get these greater benefits, you have to have active soil biology. And on the right-hand side, it's a little hard to read here, but you'll see that um, a generally healthy photosynthesis, enough sunlight, enough water, etc. A plant can start to protect itself against, for example, the fungal pathogens, so those fungal diseases. But when you start getting all of the all of the nutrients that are needed that the biology creates, then it's protected against airborne fungal diseases, uh, not just the ones in the soil, and it starts to be protected against different kinds of beetles and different kinds of worms and things that are eating at it. And all of these benefits are transferred from the plants to the animals, to the humans. So when we have a healthy soil, we're having much healthier plants, much more resistance to disease, but also our own bodies have more resistance to, all of, to insects, to fungal pathogens, to bacteria, to anything that would create a disease, to viruses, so that's all coming from the nutrition from the soil, from that active biology. 
We also have flood protection. We saw that with the plate of flour and bread. But here's an example in a real landscape in Canada. 2014, we had a flood. And all of the fields that were monocropped had terrible flooding, and they had no crop that year. Everything was rotting in the field. The water was just sitting there, and um, everybody was trying to get the water off of the land so they could replant, and then the neighbor would get mad. <laughs> and then the next one. And then in the place where they had um, more of a perennial polycrop, the, the, the river didn't even flood and the water soaked into the ground. Uh, we, with, with a healthy soil sponge, we have clean water. This is actually where you can see that algae bloom in the ocean. And you can see the dividing line there. Um, it's spreading out further and further and further from these rivers that are coming in and bringing all of those nutrients from the farms. Uh, clean air, we you know this is a big concern both here and, and in the States. Um, the soil blowing in the air, uh, not only is it hard just itself for the lungs, but it can carry a lot of pathogens with it. It can carry antibiotic resistant bacteria and special things that come from the soil that we should not be breathing. Okay, and then this is now getting into more of what Walter is going to focus on, cooling. So this is in Fahrenheit, but Vijay, can you read those and maybe translate them a little bit? But <laughs> One not seven point four. Eighty-seven point six degrees Fahrenheit. So same, same day, same, same time. Day. So twenty degrees difference. Okay, so one side has has the cooling from the plant cover, but it also has cooling from the soil moisture underneath and from the transpiration. So we have shade, we have transpiration, which cools the plant, and we have soil moisture underneath. So all three of those combine to make a much, much cooler environment. Uh, biodiversity, yep. So uh, when we have a diverse landscape, we have more diversity, and we're learning more and more and more that both psychologically and physically, we depend on a diverse landscape. We're, we can, uh, we know that, that children and adults need to be able to see diverse animals, insects, butterflies, plants, in order to feel whole, because we're part of that whole system. Next one. And here's an, another example of uh, regenerating a landscape that's been degraded. This is in Zimbabwe, and I think that's uh, 2006. Okay, that's a before picture. They have circled that just to show you that it's the same spot. 2009, after this bringing in animals to act like a, as if they were a wild herd of animals, and 2014. It's a little bit unfair because the original picture is in the dry season and this is in the after the rainy season, but you know that that first one would not look like that after the rainy season. <laughs> so, okay. And then, cool, and then cooling not just of the soil under our feet, but of the local climate. So. The difference, the average difference um, from a bare soil to a green soil up in the air above, up here, uh, is usually somewhere between, is a, the average difference is 2.3 degrees centigrade. And if you compare uh, green landscape with pavement, it's 11.7 degrees cooler. But in order to have that, you have to have water at the root zone to have that green transpiration happen. It's like sweating when the plant transpires. Just like if, if your shirt is wet or you're sweating, it cools you off. Same kind of idea. But if you don't drink water, you can't sweat. And if a plant has no water under its roots, it cannot transpire. OK, and then on a global level, uh, Mr. Yena has calculated that as little as a 5% increase in transpiration could be enough to quickly and quickly cool the climate. Okay, this is in, in theory. There's other things acting, but but um, and a, another uh, professor who wrote the textbook on environmental biophysics um, kept going with those calculations and said. 23 increase in green growth or in transpiration on agricultural soil could be enough to reverse climate change. This is huge. It's a huge important thing. So this then be enough initiative of having green uh, 365 days a year is a huge, 
huge uh, contribution to reversing climate change. Okay, so, so soil biology creates this infrastructure, this soil sponge infrastructure that provides economic benefits, social benefits, health benefits, prevention of, of natural disasters, all of these interesting, important things. So which infrastructure are we going to spend our money and time repairing? This one or this one? <laughs> okay. So thank you very much.